And welcome everyone to the Mixed Methods webinar series brought to you in part by the Mixed Methods International Research Association as well as the University of Alberta's International Institute for Qualitative Methodology. My name is Yvette, I'm with IIQM and I'll be facilitating the session today. Today's presentation is by Dr. Elizabeth G. Creamer, Professor Emerita of Educational Research and current president of the Mixed Methods International Research Association, MIRA. She is the author of the 2018 SAGE textbook, An Introduction to Fully Integrated Mixed Methods Research that is organized around different ways to integrate at the design phase during data collection and during analysis. She has hosted two pre previous webinars for IAQM and MIRA with a 2017 presentation illustrating the purposes of mixed methods research with examples from popular media and a 2018 presentation, Mixed Methods Approaches in Grounded Theory. She is the author of the in-progress textbooks with Rutledge, Advancing Theory Development with Mixed Methods. Dr. Creamer, we're very happy to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Yvette. This is uh, really thrilling. I lost my screen there, Yvette. I'm sure you'll bring it back. Yep. Um, there we go. Took a minute. Uh, there are, I'm astonished by the turnout for this webinar and thrilled. We had almost 300 people sign up for it, so I imagine that many people are still trying to get online. Um, I will uh, share the PowerPoints from this presentation. You've got my email in this first slide. It's also at the end of this presentation. So for people who can't get on or maybe get on later, uh, I'm happy to share those. Yvette mentioned that I'm the president of the International Mixed Methods Association called MIRA. I'm sure some of you are members and some of you are just now hearing about it. We are um, 650 members strong, a professional association really focusing on mixed methods. And at our last global conference, we had people from 42 different countries. So one thing that really distinguishes us is the ability to create an international uh, network, to connect with an international network of people enthusiastic about the potential of mixed methods, um, not only in research, but in teaching. So I'm the one that sends out a weekly newsletter. Um, some of you may get, some of you may read. I'm also the one who um, has now taken over coordinating the webinars and some other activities. So I turn out to be a very, uh, I've really enjoyed the presidency. It's after I retired after 38 years and um, the community of people. So let me move on a little bit and just say another word or two about myself in addition to what um, Yvette has said. This is a picture of me in Japan at the Japan Regional Conference, which was held in 2017. They're doing another one in 2019 in September, and I'll be there keynoting along with some other people. So um, it's very, very exciting to uh, the enthusiasm for mixed methods in these diverse settings continues to astonish me. As she mentioned that I am the author of the textbook I'm holding, An Introduction to Fully Integrated Research, which really devotes four different chapters to different ways to mix. It kind of builds on what I want to talk today about, which is the idea of an integrated design. One of the biggest criticisms, and I think possibly a justified criticism of mixed methods, is its tendency to, um, particularly in the foundational literature, to focus on it as a set of isolated procedures of ways, for example, uh, to design a study in terms of the timing of data collection or the sequence of data collection. And I think that may have led to the label mixed up research that I used to hear from some of my colleagues when I was working and teaching mixed methods. So that's part of what I did for 38 years at Virginia Tech was um, teach and juggle other roles. I didn't teach mixed methods for 38 years, but I did start teaching it in the late 90s when people were just beginning to really write and think about it. So when you think about the integrated design, what you're trying to do is step back and think 
not necessarily what methods am I going to use, what am I going to do first, do I have a sequential design or concurrent design, but to have in your mind a, a holistic image of your research project. Even while you have it in your mind, you're trying to keep that image flexible. So it's a flexible floating kind of picture that you could put up on the bulletin board over your desk and it helps you to imagine a coherent way to pick your methods your, to design your data collection. So there's several ways to do that and that's what I'm going to approach today. So people use the word design in many different ways. Um, historically, in mixed methods, the word has been associated with um, the timing of what you do first or whether you collect qual and quant data simultaneously or sequentially. And that collecting qual and quant data is certainly central to the definition of mixed methods. But it by itself doesn't mean you have mixed methods. So just because you have qualitative and quantitative data sources does not necessarily mean that you have a mixed method study. And it doesn't really offer you a way to see it as an integrated whole. So by the word design, we mean conceiving of a study or project as a logically coherent systematic whole it begins not with a design, but with a clearly defined research purpose. And as I said, is subject to ongoing revisions. So what I'm going to talk about that is first in terms of conceiving um, your problem. And I know most of you bring a, bring a research question or problem to this in a multidimensional way which I think is also a theoretical way. So thinking of it in a multidimensional way lends very much to theory. Um, you can do this also by the second bullet is imagining or constructing an integrated framework from the literature. This also allows you to think of your study in an integrated way. Then diverse perspectives helps you to engage complexity in your study lead to more nuanced findings. Then I talk about some of the challenges of interfacing with conventional designs, what constrains integration, because integration can certainly um, be a coherent framework for your study, what facilitates integration. And then I end with a reference list. The references are embedded at the bottom of the slides, but I realize when you get a PDF of the slides, you can't see those references, so they are all at the end of the slides. The chat box is open, and I have found from other um, uses of web, other webinars that you, some people are real comfortable posting questions as we go in the chat box. I'm fine with that. I'll pause at a few places and see if I can um, pick up on some of those questions, because I know sometimes you think of a question and then it disappears. So several authors, including Baisley and our, fam our famous Pat Baisley, a former president and equally as famous Tony Amaguzi, distinguish an integrated mixed methods approach as one that really centers integration into the logic of the way it's conducted. So it really foregrounds integration as something that's very, very critical in mixed methods research. And it could surprise you to know that that's really not characteristic of all mixed methods designs, which to be honest with you, historically tend to keep the two strands pretty distinct until you reach um, the end of the process. And that's not a, an approach that I think uh, captures a lot of the complexity of the kind of research that people do now when you look at individuals engaged in, in interactions in many different kinds of settings. So my own approach called Fully Integrated Mixed Methods Research, which derives from Tedley and Tasha Khoury's 203 and 210 handbooks, 
but really conceives of it quite in quite a different way, conceives of it as a more interactive, directly engaging qual and quant um, approaches through all phases of the research project, from the way the project is designed or conceived, which is really what we're talking about today, to the way research questions are structured. We'll see an example of that in a minute, to the way the data are collected, to the way they are analyzed, and then finally brought together sometimes in a theoretical model. So this is a very interactive view of the way mixed methods can be employed and really counters the assumption that so plagued people early on the argument that they are fundamentally different paradigms and can't be mixed. So that's sort of the, um, the counter. And yes, Colleen has written a question about the slides. Um, the, the webinar itself is archived on the IIQM site so that you can get the audio version of it just like you're getting live now. The slides you can um, email me and I will send them to you directly happily. I may put them up on ResearchGate as well. So an integrated approach that is interested in engaging qualitative, quantitative data and approaches very, very interactively. Um, so perhaps you have both qualitative and quantitative data about the effectiveness of an intervention, you would call it if you're in a medical field, of a program, of an activity. Um, sometimes, often, those don't jive. Perhaps you have data from different constituents. Um, if you're in a school setting, that might be students, it might be teachers, it might be administrators, it might be board members. Those are all signals to you that you have what is, what is referred to as a, a complex design. Cheryl Poff is the person who has written the most uh, and recently about the link between mixed methods and complexity. She has a very nice article in the uh, International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches, which she applies the complexity framework to mixed methods research. And the bridge I make is to talk about how it is um, compatible with a fully integrated approach. So this approach recognizes that we work in environments as educators or health researchers or policy makers or evaluators. We work in environments where, our, um, where um, things are shifting constantly. Things are shifting constantly. You have differences across sites to accommodate. And that requires a dynamic design, not a prefixed design. So this article here by Poff was in the International Journal of Multiple Researches Approaches that it's edited by Tony Almaguzzi uh, and John Hitchcock. So those are um, complexity challenges, the idea that we can fix in cement at the onset, um, a simple design to our research. And instead, we often have research that has concurrent phases where you analyze qual and quant separately, sequential phases where you uh, uh, analyze them sequentially, as well as iterative phases where they're really interacting um, with each other. I like the image of the bubble because I learned recently, and I think this fits with complexity, that a female mathematician had to come, came up with the first, one of the first new geometric formulas recently, and that that was required to capture this sort of fluid nature of a bubble. So I'm very intrigued with that bubble image and why I link it to complexity. So one of the first ways that you can begin in your own research project to think about um, your core construct in both a theoretical and integrated way 
is to move from thinking of your core construct as a unidimensional quality and thinking it of it only in terms of sort of its relationship to one other variable. So in this picture, I'm capturing the way we've been trained, honestly, since most of us have training strong, you know, have much training in the quantitative tradition. We're often thinking of our variable, our core construct, what's at the heart of our study? What interests us? Is it learning? Is it engagement? Um, is it some form of development? Is it identity? We tend to think of that as a very individualistic thing. Pat Baisley writes about this. So does Kathy Charmez write about this, who's Kathy is well known for her work in grounded theory. We in the Western world, and there are many online that are not from the Western world, and I'm pleased with that, tend to think of our variables what you know in terms of the individual. We think of identity, for example, in terms of the identity uh, in terms of the individual. And then we we're interested in what is related to that. So that's a fundamental step one way to envision our core construct that is the heart of our purpose and our aim. But you, if you want to move theoretically into a more integrated approach, then you really need to blow up your thinking and your reasoning and explode it in a way and think of it more multidimensionally. So this figure is the first of two that gives you an idea of how you could do that. It doesn't require you to consult an existing theory, but it allows you to think of that core construct, not only in terms of the individual where we start, but in terms of interactions, um, in terms of groups, and in terms of cultural and cross-cultural dimensions. So let me say that again. So here you've got a core construct. Probably most of us start out thinking of that individually. But we can also think of that core construct, let's take identity, in terms of how it's influenced by factors like interaction. Maybe it's interaction with a peer on a team. Maybe it's interaction with a mentor. We can also think of it in terms of a group. A group can be a community, so it could be a team of researchers. And then we bring in the all-important cross-cultural dimension. So here's another way to visualize this idea of imagining your core construct in a multidimensional way. And when I do this um, I in, in workshops, I, I stop here and ask people to start drawing and thinking about their constructs in a more multi-dimensional or integrated way that then ultimately feeds to how you structure your instruments, how you structure um, your data collection analysis, because you also then want to move to begin to think about the relationships. So again, if you start down at the bottom, you might be looking at how an individual learns, develops, changes, you might be looking at their identity, their engagement. When you move up to relationships, you're thinking about who influences that, that um, phenomenon, that core phenomena, who, who's close by uh, and is shaping it, because people rarely are operating in that sort of sanitary bubble that we imagine. The group could be a social network. So as soon as you get into social network analysis, you are looking at interactions among people. You are looking at who's interacting with whom and how much. This could be the group, could be a neighborhood. It could be an urban space. Indigenous scholars tell us, for example, that you cannot uh, understand the way an individual works without understanding the groups that they affiliate. Um, you would really see this in immigrant research. Uh, you also have the dimension of an organization. This could be the broader umbrella of a school. It could be a hospital. It could be a community organization. Uh, and then you have cultural influences that shape attitudes and behaviors and can vary dramatically. 
So when you think multidimensionally, you're also thinking, um, also thinking of the relationships between the variables. I want you to know that in the chat, we get people from South America, uh, South Africa, Colombia, China, Mexico, and that thrills me um, as a member of the mixed methods community. So here's an example, um, and this is by a pair of collaborators, Evans, Kuhn, and Umi, that appeared in the Journal of Mixed Methods. And it's a study about caregiving in Mexican-American immigrant communities. Um, it uses the life course perspective. So there's two points I want to make about this slide. The life course perspective is both a theoretical framework and a methodology. And it's a methodology in that it sort of dictates your constructs and how you're going to study them. So in the life course perspective, which is only one of many that play that role, time is important. And you see that across the bottom of this multi-layered figure. So the reason I show you this figure is this was their initial conceptualization. So they're presenting a multi-dimensional conceptualization of their constructs which they later in the same um, article present another figure which updates this and, and makes it very specific. But so they start with this conceptual framing that is multidimensional. In this case, it comes from the life course perspective. So in the middle of that, you have three levels of, um, of factors. Burden and gain refers to individual stressors, um, what they gained from the caregiving relationship and the burden it placed on them. But also endemic to this conceptualization is conceiving of their variable as influenced by culture and context. So there you've got that multidimensional mindset. That means you would go on and collect data about all these parts of the model. That kind of multidimensional framing goes on to be reflected in multi-level research questions. So here I have the research question from that same study by Evans et al which appeared in the Journal of Mixed Methods Research in 2011. And one of the uh, tricks here is that you can facilitate integration not by having separate qual and quant research questions, and by separate I mean here addressing separate constructs, but by addressing the same core construct through your qual, quant, and mixed questions. So here, you're also tying it to the data collection instruments. So you've got a, a question, the first question, which with, is a from quant scale, so they use pre-existing scales, about the burdens and levels of strain. Then you looked again at the level of strain through the qual instruments and linked it to these other factors, those other multi-dimensional factors of culture and family. And in life course, you do that through life drawings. People note key events on a timeline or trajectory. And then during the qual interview, you discuss it. And then also they collected more on another type of mixing during analysis the emotional and physical consequences. So you see, this is a way of designing a set of interla interlinked research questions that are all a type of, of mixing, but all are revolving around that same um, core construct. Let me show you one more um, example of starting with a conceptual framework and then I'll pause for a second if anyone wants to 
post a question in the chat before I kind of move on to uh, the second part of this. So I mentioned that another way to, to frame your study in an integrated way is to begin with a conceptual framework. Now, a conceptual framework in this context is one that you have built in from the literature. So the example I just gave you is a conceptual framework built from the literature, in their case, a specific body of literature about the life course perspective. This is a, um, this is a model developed by a woman named Robin Whittemore. It comes out of the Journal of Nursing. So this is nursing. And this is her conceptualization of the literature at the beginning in the form of a grounded theory model. So she synthesized the literature to develop this conceptual model and it formed an integrated framework to guide the rest of the study. Um, I would say that the integrated framework alone does not make it mixed methods in and of itself, but it certainly is related to higher quality because it's related to this coherent framework and because it's theory. So again, notice, let me show you how this is a grounded theory model. She has precursors, and in this case, her topic area was studying the long-term effects and short-term effects of reco recovering from trauma. And the trauma she's interested in is surgery. So she has precursors, precursors or antecedents that influence this. Um, the center part is uh, in a grounded theory model is processes and activities that promote or lead to the outcomes or consequences. And then she models this as consequences. So the reason this is integrated is you can see if you start with this kind of framework, just as the Evans model, this tells you what kind of data collection to do. It sends you out to look for existing instruments that might be out there that you could use to test parts of this model. But the trick to an integrated mixed methods model is not to think, okay, I'm going to get block one from the quant, block two from the qual, block three from the quant, block four from the qual, but is to think, now how can I get some of these key constructs um, from both the qual and the quant. How can I measure it both qualitatively and quality, quantitatively? Because that's where you get the nuance. That's where you get the subtlety that can really make your um, research top top notch. So if they, uh, Natalia, I'll pause just a second in case anyone wants to pop a question in. And then I'm going to move on to the challenge of um, using the traditional basic design typologies. Um, and there's just a few slides about this. When you get into complex designs, I'm going to come right back to Natalia. When you get into complex designs, you often have to find new ways to um, visualize those from the conventional ones that you see in the foundational literature. So your challenge, usually the process is more iterative, there are more phases to it, um, and so it's a challenge. Uh, so N Nalia asks, is it possible to visualize the quant part in this question? How do stroke survivors perceive oral health, address oral health issues, and experience the provision of oral health? Now, yeah, a quant question is almost always has an embedded hypothesis that one variable is related to the another. In some cases, in uh, the the these qualities or these activities are related to an outcome. So if you switch that to imagining two variables, 
uh, and exploring their relationships, you almost automatically get to a quant question there. When you use wording like affect um, or relationships, you're implying quant. So here we have kind of, this is a conventional configuration. And um, contemporary writers like Pat Baisley in her wonderful 2018 book, all about mixing during analysis, um, argues that this particular model inhibits um, the ability to, to have that kind of active engagement that I am talking about. This you might recognize as a classic concurrent model. This is taken from a figure drawn that I'm going to use twice. In Yoko, a Japanese uh, student, was a Japanese student from Japan, Yoko Kaomara. This is from her dissertation. She was working with uh, one of the leaders in her field, Natalia Ivankova. And this is a classic uh, concurrent design. The qual and the quant you see in this design are, are conducted simultaneously. Somehow, one person in a dissertation is analyzing both the qualitative and quantitative data, if not simultaneously, separately. And then in this classic design, they are not brought together during data collection or during data analysis. But that is really postponed to the last point where a model is developed. So in this case, the model doesn't drive an integrated framework. Um, it comes in at the end. Um, this particular model often um, this concurrent model, you'll often see it as the first step in a more complex design. So I mentioned that complex designs often have both concurrent and sequential phases. So this might be the first phase, but unlikely to be the final phases. So this is a concurrent design and in and of itself, because it postpones integration, is not one that is thought to promote the kind of dialectical exchange. Here's another more integrated approach. And this is one of the exemplars that I use in my textbook. And this is um, a figure from my textbook. And I see that you're really not getting it all. But the part of this, and this is a, also a dissertation, I try in my research to feature dissertations to sort of counter the idea that an individual can't do these kinds of things in a realistic way in a dissertation, which is an assumption that drives me slightly crazy. But the exciting part about this visualization is that in the middle of it is a third column that is used to portray integration. So in this case, she started by analyzing the qual data from her teachers. And this is a study, I believe, about engagement. And then she did a really cool thing for integration. She developed her qual themes. And then in the middle, she's highlighting how she shifted to mixing. And in the second part of her study, which is really sequential, she integrated by taking her qualitative themes and looking for factors in her survey that could represent those qualitative themes. So she shifted from the sort of separate, non-integrated approach, which is the current concurrent design, to portraying a more current, uh, a more sequential design. Now, one of the ways to um, also enhance the quality of your study. So an integrated design conceptualization is one way. Thinking of your construct as multi-level is another. Resisting the desire to seek confirmation and triangulation is a third. So mixed methods is really launched with the idea that its primary purpose is you know you get more than one source of data and it triangulates or confirms or builds the validity of your constructs 
and that's a very legitimate use, but it's um, kind of a restricted use of it in that it really doesn't build on the explanatory potential um, the explanatory potential when you have this kind of integrated approach. So that Whittemore study is 2005, not 2006, uh, Chelsea, and it's in the Journal of Nursing Scholarship. Um, ah, yeah, Carrie's, thank you. Carrie's responding to Chelsea. Very nice in the chat box. So I'm talking about um, enhancing quality in studies by an integrated design, by thinking theoretically, and by deliberately building complexity and nuance into your study. Uh, Judith Schoenenbaum and Burke Johnson have a wonderful 2015 article. It kind of, to tell you the truth, wanders through some different points, but it has some very... Um, a nice table that summarizes different ways you can achieve, uh, you can build dissonance or complexity into your study. And that's a 2015 article that appears in Qualitative Health Research. Now I've enhanced this, um, but they're suggesting that again at the onset, at the design of a study, that you resist that confirmation um, and you try to, the drive for confirmation, and you try to think of explanatory power and how can you enhance your explanatory power and the applicability of what you uh, discover to many settings. And here are some ways you can do this. Um, for instance, you can build diversity even in, in your sample, even into your qualitative sampling that you intentionally seek out in your qualitative research. Um, people who um, have different points of view, people who have different perspectives. Many consider the team itself a, a way to build in complexity and diversity because of diverse perspectives. but. An example here is always to um, recognize that when you're studying outcomes of an intervention, you're going to have a group that prosper under the intervention. You're going to have a group that the intervention has little impact on. And you could possibly well have a group that um, uh, the, it, it not only is it not a positive income, it's not a, neg it's not a neutral uh, impact, that the intervention actually could have a negative impact, the opposite of what you expect. Now, the way to build this into an integrated framework is a research question that's, that addresses this. What is the difference? What are the differences between those who most benefit and those who least benefit? If you were studying engagement or identity, you could frame the same question. What are the characteristics of those who are most actively engaged, as well as those who are not actively engaged in a classroom climate? In terms of identity, those whose identity does not change, those whose identity does change. So building these kinds of uh, diversity of perspectives in from the get-go is a way to enhance quality. Another way to do that, and this is my addition to this list, is wander outside the security of your own content area. If you're studying engagement, go see what someone in a different discipline says about engagement. Um, that is a vehicle for creative and innovative thought that is new to your own discipline. So I mentioned the difficulty in finding ways to highlight the complexity of the research. And I just want to show this as an example of um, a way that you can highlight diversity, uh, integration, um, not diversity, but integration into the way you present your mixed method model. So this is a 208 article. Um, I think this is the single best 
representation or a visualization I have ever seen that highlights ways that you can let the reader know that you integrated your sources of data. Um, this example comes from qualitative health research. So this comes out of qualitative um, uh, research, a journal about uh, health research. And what's wonderful about this is in the left column, they're listing seven ways they integrated their data. And then in the right column, they're linking those back to reasons for integration. There are other ways to display that, but this is telling your reader, look how central integration was to my findings. Um, and this is something you could use or a variation of this. Now let me show you one other strategy for integration. Uh, two other strategies for integration, and I have to move quickly here. So this is called a joint display, and I won't say too much about it, but it's another example from my textbook. Uh, Tim Guterman, G-U-E-T-T-E-R-M-A-N, is going to do a webinar um, shortly in June, I believe, about joint displays. Joint displays are integrative because they juxtapose qualitative and quantitative data in the same figure or table and usually draw new insights from it. Another example of a joint display is when you produce a qualitative, when you produce a conceptual model or visualization that combines qualitative and quantitative data. So this is an example from the dissertation from the um, woman who's active in the Japanese Mixed Methods Association. And what's really, really nice about this model is that she has, she um, designates um, paths that came from qual, paths that came from quant, paths that came from both qual and quant. And here she is um, conceptualizing her qual and quant data together rather than perpetually keeping them separate. So I've talked about a number of the design features that inhibit um, integration, that kind of integrated perspective. I'll highlight two, um, not talking and reporting about how you integrated data, not having a section and methods or analysis that addresses ways of integrating not making that clear to your reader. We've already talked about research questions that assume, um, you know, one question in qual is about one construct and quant is about another. Um, you can link those, um, but that is not the way that, the way that most promotes integration. So design features that, um, facilitate integration. I've mentioned most of these and I'm watching the time, so um, um, I won't go through all of these. But one way to build an integrated framework into your um, uh, initial design, other than the ones we've already talked about, is to conceive of, to offer multiple explanations for the problem that you are pursuing. Perhaps there's several competing theoretical explanations. If you frame your purpose statement with those competing explanation, bam, you have an integrated structure. Sampling, having data, both qual and quant data, at least some from the same sample, enhances the potential for integration, absolutely enhances it. It doesn't have to be all the constructs, um, but for some of them, and you certainly saw that in the Evans study. Um, and an analysis, uh, I haven't been able to talk about that, but the idea of being uh, considering variability. So I'm coming, sort of coming to the end. I want to tell you that I have a number of YouTube, so you can, um, I hope you can get ready. Um, 
I hope you can get get ready to think about some questions. You can pop them in the chat or in a bit. Yvette will come on. Um, I have a YouTube channel with um, some other videos. Yvette mentioned the webinars. I want to say uh, also a little bit. Here's my reference list. It's at the end of the slides. Um, I want and here's my email if you'd like a copy of the slides. I just want to pop in a couple more thoughts about the Mixed Method International Research Association. This is our alternate year. Um, in the alternate year, we have so-called, or it's an odd-numbered year, we have so-called regional conferences. And that only means that they draw primarily, but not exclusively, from the region. So we just came from a conference in the Caribbean in Trinidad that drew from the Caribbean, but also many other countries. In September, I mentioned the conference in Japan that will draw from Malaysia and Indonesia and um, many areas of that part of the world as well as the rest of the world. And then in December, we have um, what's called the Australasia uh, conference in in New Zealand, in Wellington, New Zealand. So I'll stop there because of my enthusiasm for Mira can carry me away. But if you would like to have uh, a world of people interacting with your own research, I think both the Japanese conference and the New Zealand conference are still accepting proposals. They do roundtables and they also um, have uh, regular research papers as well. So let's see what kind of questions we've got. And Yvette can come back and I will, um, let me look at. Thank you very much, Dr. Creamer. Um, so if anyone does have questions, you can raise your hand or you can type them into the chat below. I think someone had a request to post your reference slides again. Um, if you can do that. And then we there have a go. question from Rauna. Professor Creamer, when are you coming to Africa? Especially you invite South me. Africa. <laughs> Just invite me. It'll have to be 2020, but uh, pretty book for 2019. But uh, there are some wonderful people active in South Africa. Vanessa Sherman, Bridget, um, Bridget Schmidtman had a conference in South Africa last year. Um, I am hoping we will get more another South African person on the board. Um, Tony Amaguzi has been very active in South Africa as well, but I would love to come to South Africa and South America too. Actually, I, those are, haven't been on, I've only been to um, Peru, so I want to expand. Um, Nairobi, Kenya. This is so exciting. It's so exciting. Visual, I'm going to say a little bit about visualization while you think because someone posed a question. I would say that visualizations, whether they're in figures that juxtapose, qual figures that include qualitative and quantitative data, or tables that include qualitative and quantitative data, are absolutely essential in um, promoting more sophisticated analysis so they can be used as a step to more sophisticated analysis. It can be like the example I showed you could um, that juxtaposed, if I can take it off this for just a second. Um, this is lining up a quant score from an instrument with participant numbers and quotes and then beginning to identify a pattern. And then if you pursue this pattern with further analysis, I call this, um, that be makes this a formative display. So it's summative when you just lay them side by side and just stop there. But if laying them side by side reveals new patterns that you could then pursue with some of your data or other um, techniques, then I call that a formative um, use of a joint display. So um, they can enhance, they can represent analysis, they can be a stopping point, like the Kawamura one is a stopping point, she ended there, but it can also launch the next phase of research or further analysis. 
Okay. Crossover. Go ahead. We've got a question from Emma Jing. I study management. Are you aware of the application of mixed methods in this discipline? Yes. Um, Rosalind Cameron. Rosalind Cameron, C A M E R O N, from Australia, has done quite a bit about mixed methods research and management and business. In fact, she just posted something. Um, about journals that publish mixed methods in management. There have been quite a few systematic reviews of the use of mixed methods in management. I can think of three. Cameron, I think, is the author of at least one. So I would suggest first looking to Rosalind Cameron, Professor Rosalind Cameron from Australia for that topic area. Okay, and our, excuse me, our next is from is there a specific framework for mixed methods research that should be used? I lost some of that there, but I think it had something to do with Jennifer Green, did it? Um, specific uh, literature framework for mixed methods research that should be used? Uh, literature framework. Is there a specific framework? literature framework for mixed methods research. Let me think about that for a second. Um, the question about crossover analysis, let me tell you what that is. Tony Amaguzi, O-N-W-U-E-G-B-U-Z-I-E, is the one that coined that expression, crossover analysis. What it really means is you, uh, an example of it is mixed method researchers, unlike some qualitative researchers, are more than happy to quantify qual data when it's appropriate and then try to use it in statistical procedures, realizing the limitations. So in crossover analysis, you use quantitative procedures on qualitative data or qualitative procedures on quantitative data. So let me give you an example of that last one, um, uh, qualitative applications to quantitative. Let's say you have a cluster map. You've produced a cluster map. And a cluster map is graphed on two axes and creates groups of people or, um, and often names them. The, the researcher names them. That can launch that quantitative procedure can launch another round of analysis, so it's a type of crossover analysis, when the researcher begins to say, oh, look at this similarities, look at the difference between this cluster and that cluster. What's the relationship between these clusters? So in other words, you use that cluster map to then move on to additional uh, analysis in, in sort of a formative way. Um, I agree that dialectical pluralism is, uh, uh, yes, I, um, I am very much convinced that dialectical pluralism and Burke Johnson gets the credit for that language. He has a very nice um, editorial in the Journal of Mixed Methods about dialectical pluralism, but that always goes back to Jennifer Green and her initial conceptualization of mixed methods in her 207 book um, that she talks about a mixed method way of thinking. And Johnson is very influenced. He's, he's a close colleague of Green. So dialectical pluralism as a paradigm for mixed methods is the idea that you are very purposeful about engaging diverse perspectives. It's like Qual will give you one, you know, give you a diverse, qual and quant give you diverse perspectives. You should start with the assumption that they're going to be different and that the difference is the strength of it. It's the nuance. It's the complexity. Um, so I do believe that di dialectical pluralism is a very strong foundation for the kind of interactive and integrative research that we're talking about. Yes, integration is 
Um, one question is integration done during the interpretation phrase. Baisley and I both criticized the traditional views of mixed methods, the ones that came out of the 90s, because they assume it only happens at interpretation. They assume in the original literature, you analyze the qual, you draw a conclusion. You analyze the quant, you draw a conclusion. And then only essentially in the discussion part of your paper, not during analysis, do you try to bring those together. So if you have quant data about an outcome and you have qual data about strategies, then in the discussion section you say, well, they could be related because of this and they could be related because of that. But when you leave that solely to interpretation, you're not using the analytical power that you have to explore some of those connections. You're really leaving it to um, the interpretation phase. Okay. Oh. And our mm -hmm. next question comes from Ingrid Hunt Anderson. How can we ensure full integration when our mixed method research design is emergent? Oh, great question. Um, I would say, and Pop would say, that in complex design, you always want to be open to the emergent. And the emergent is often something you couldn't have anticipated. So an unanticipated finding happens. It's not what you were expecting. You can sweep that under the rug, um, or which is... Uh, you could sweep that under the rug or pursue it. So I would argue that most fully integrated complex designs are always going to have an emergent quality and that that's good despite what your advisor may tell you if you're a doctoral student to hurry, hurry, hurry and ignore all the dissonance and divergence which is likely where the originality and creativity is. Okay. okay. This question comes from Yan C. Do you have any recommended articles using qualitative approach for quantitative data? Mm, that's brand new. Yan C. Yan C. That's brand new. That is totally brand new. Um, that is uh, something that is really more possibility. So no, I um, I encourage you to pursue that. It's more an idea right now than a possibility. Um, we call it qualitizing. Um, it's more an idea and a possibility. You could see it in the literature about crossover analysis. Case-based analysis, real quick, I got two minutes, Carrie. Um, you um, consider a case-based analysis is almost like you, you know, it's like creating like in the Evans study, they used a case-based analysis and, they, and the unit of analysis was the caregiving pair. So they had qual and quant data and essentially created many cases um, for each caregiving pair. And I think they had 110 caregiving pairs. And then you're really analyzing it as a whole rather than as separate variables. Oh, she says she's doing it in her dissertation. All right, we're probably going to have to end soon. Yep, if any yeah, other um, Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth uh, is available, you can send to her. You can send to me, and I will forward them to her. Uh, this time, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to our presentation. Um, next month, um, Pat Beasley will be speaking on research in multi um, multi-dimensional world, and that's May 13th at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. So hopefully you guys can all come out to that. Uh, your continued support of this series is what lets us go on. So we thank you very much for coming. Um, Dr. Creamer, thank you very much. Did you have any final words? No, I really enjoyed it. Great question. Um, great questions. I wish we had more time. This is so exciting. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a good day. Bye-bye.